Now this week we're going to talk about, in Philippians chapter 3, the idea of losing and winning. Losing and winning. What we're going to do is we're going to take a look at Philippians chapter 3, but I want you to think about this idea. It's not here in your notes right now, but I want you to think about this spiritual application. I have to lose more to gain more. I have to lose more to gain more. And we're going to unpack this in a little bit, but I just want you to think about that idea. In order for me to gain more, I have to lose more and have it in the right perspective. So we're going to take a look at Philippians chapter 3 and write this down as we begin. Watch out for the losers. Watch out for the losers. This week I had an opportunity. I saw... I had an invitation to go play some basketball with a group of guys, some from the church. And it's pretty bad when you get to the basketball court, you realize you're like one of the top two old guys in the group. So even though you're huffing and puffing, you really can't show everybody that you're huffing and puffing because you're supposed to be in shape. Not really. But anyways, it was a lot of fun. We had a good time. And there's something about when a group of guys get together. There's a few that have to rise to the top and basically say, hey, I want you to know I'm the top dog here. I want you to know I'm the best on this court. I want you to know I'm really, really good and you are not. So just in case if it crosses your mind to just come and defend me, be aware you're going to get run over. So after a few of the guys talked what we know as smack talk, you know, we started playing and, and it's very interesting because in sports we know that there are winners and there are losers. You're going to win or you're going to lose. But sometimes we don't think of winners and losers in the context of spiritual relationships, in the context of spiritual doctrine, in the context of what people are putting into our minds and pouring into our lives. But Paul starts on Philippians chapter 3, and let's just read this first verse. He says, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. So this is a word that we've seen over and over again in Philippians. He says, rejoice in chapter 1, rejoice in chapter 2. But now, in chapter 3, he says, rejoice in the Lord. So now he's starting this off, and he's not closing the letter here. He still has another couple of sections and another chapter. But he's basically saying, okay, guys, furthermore, for the rest of you, here is what I want you to focus on. Rejoice in the Lord. And he continues, to write the same things to you is no trouble to me, and it is safe for you. So Paul starts this chapter, and he's really focusing in on what's key to the Christian faith. The key to the Christian faith is not a set of traditions, it's not a set of rules, it's not a set of practices. It's a person. It's the person of Jesus Christ. And when you know him as your savior, you know the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And the Christian life, if we can simplify it, is knowing Christ more and changing my life and allowing him to change my life to be conformed into his image. So that at the end of my life, I'm closer to what he is than what I was. I'm more like Christ in the end than I was in the beginning because I'm allowing him to change me from the inside out. So Paul begins to look at them and says, listen guys, I want you to know, the things that I'm going to tell you, it's to protect you. Because there are people coming in that are going to say things that are going to trouble you. And maybe they won't trouble you, but you know what? It's going to trouble you. And I want to protect you, but I want you to focus on this. And here's one of the applications. Experiencing spiritual joy in Christ is the key to winning. Your life and mine, the key to winning is experiencing the joy that only comes from Christ. It's longing for the Lord. It's longing to know him more. We know what's going to happen in the end, right? There are going to be losers and winners. Who's going to win in the end? Who's going to win in the end? Christ is going to win. We're going to win because we're on the winning team. Now, some of you were not fully awake, so let's say that again. In the end, who's going to win? 
Christ is going to win. He's going to be crowned Lord of Lords. We're going to be with him in heaven forever. It's going to be great. So in this spiritual battle, in this spiritual chess game, Satan and his followers, they're going to lose. But Christ and his followers are going to win. But in the meantime, we have to deal with stuff. We have to deal with junk. We have to deal with garbage. Now, Paul steps back and he says, okay, guys, I want you to focus on these three things. More than likely, it's the same group of people, just three different characteristics. And he says the following. Look here, verse 2. Look out for the dogs. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, the more spiritual ones in our church, you're thinking, and finish this phrase, who let the dogs? Okay, I know some of you guys. So let's go back to the scripture here. He's not talking about those dogs, okay? He says, look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, and look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Now, what he's saying here to these guys is, listen, I want you to pay attention. I want you to place your eye and look for this. I don't want you to miss this. This is much too important. I want, when you see this, take notice. Beware, because this is happening, and you're going to be impacted by it. So the first thing he says is, look out for these people. Look for these people, those that are coming in, and we're going to describe what each of those are. He says, look out for the dogs. Beware of dogs. Write this down, please. People who are recklessly impure in their thoughts and live without self-control. People who are recklessly impure in their thoughts and live without self-control. One of the things I was reminded of in the basketball court is just how frequently and mindlessly people curse all the time. I forgot about that. You know, back when I was with a particular company, people were cursing all the time and I was used to it. You know, people don't really curse here at the church office, in case you haven't known that. But anyways, in the basketball court, everybody's cursing, up, you know, cousin this and that, and everybody's, you know, boasting in themselves and this is all fine. But Paul says, listen, I want you to pay attention to the dogs. Now, who are the dogs? The dogs in the New Testament times the dogs were people who were introducing false teaching. That was part of it. But dogs in the New Testament time, just like today, you see dogs in the street all the time. You see wild dogs all the time. You know, they eat whatever garbage they can. They're fighting constantly with other dogs. They're practically homeless. I was watching something in the History Channel the other day, and they had these dogs, I believe it was in Africa, and they were saying that these particular dogs have more endurance than just about any other animal. And when they find a flock of food, basically moving food, you know, their prey, they get into this competition of endurance. And all they do is a group of them, about six of them go to the right, about six of them go to the left, and about four or five stay in the back. And all they do, and the camera's following these guys, all they do is outrun their prey. And as soon as their prey just can't go anymore, you know, it's getting night, nightfall's coming down and they're just too tired. They come and attack their victim. And in less than 10 minutes, they've eaten a gigantic animal and there are only bones left. Well, Paul is basically saying, listen, the people who are these dogs are without control. They can't control themselves. They're recklessly living. They're saying things because it just comes out of their mouth. It's really all about them. It's really all about what they can look like in front of the other people. And Paul is saying, listen, I want you to be aware of these people. I want you to know that these people are going to come in and they're going to try and hurt you. Number two, beware of the evildoers. Those who live to draw attention to themselves and teach things that are destructive to others. There was a group of guys during this time called the Judaizers, okay? There's not a band today called the Judaizers, but back then there was a group of guys that were referred to as the Judaizers. And some of them, they professed to say, yes, Jesus is the Messiah. We recognize Jesus as the Messiah, but 
if somebody really wants to know God and they want to be right with God, they essentially have to become a Jew in order to become right with God. So if you and I, who most of us are not Jews, if we wanted to come to know God, they would say, okay, um, Marcel, you're 42 years old. You come from this nation over here. At 42 years old, you need to do all of these things as part of the Jewish faith and then add on Jesus as the Messiah. And then here you go. Paul said, no, that's not what it's about. And these guys were teaching this to the church and they were saying, you know, this is what you need to do. You know, if you're a male and you weren't circumcised as a child, then now at 42, you need to be circumcised. Ouch. Ouch. And what they were doing is they were confusing the believers. These guys were worshiping God in spirit and truth. And all of a sudden, this group of guys, so-called Christians, came in and said, no, no, no. You have to add these things. You're not a real Christian unless you follow all of these traditions, unless you submit yourself to our teaching, adapt these 618, 19 laws that we're going to throw on top of the Ten Commandments and this and that. And it just created problems. You know, that's really no different than what happens today. People say you need to add all of these things to your faith to really become a Christian. I was baptized as a young baby like many of you were, not because I wanted to, but because that's what my parents did. It was not something I said, I'm ready to go be baptized because I was much too small. But they took me and I was baptized and according to this church, I was then a part of the church, a part of the family of God. The problem with that is that everyone who comes to God must come because they have been broken. The Spirit of God has worked in them and they are now repenting. Listen, your parents may come to church. That doesn't make you a Christian. Your abuelita may have been a prayer warrior. That doesn't make you a believer. But also what doesn't make you a believer is to follow a set of traditions that in the end are just a product of your own flesh. Paul was telling them, listen, there are guys that are going to come in and they're going to give you this laundry list of things that you need to do to be right with God. Listen, they're only concerned about themselves. They're only concerned about how they look in the presence of other people. They're dogs. They're evil workers. Leave them alone. Then we have a third group. We have a third group. Look here in your notes. It says, beware of those who mutilate the flesh. It says here, those who practice religion physically, but do not know the truth spiritually. Those who practice religion physically, but do not know the truth spiritually. Paul in one sense was being sarcastic as he begins to write this because this word mutilation essentially means cut down. It means to cut down and then cut off. So when he's telling these people this, it had a certain shock value. Have you ever been shocked by what someone says to you? And you're like, wow, I can't believe you just said that. Well, that was one of those words where, you know, Paul's saying, listen, those who chop, those who are just cutting themselves off. And in a, another part, he says, I wish they would cut themselves off and do the same thing. But then he goes on and he says something that's really interesting. Until we get to that point, write this down. It says, let your position in Christ energize your confidence for living. Let your position in Christ energize your confidence for living. So Paul begins to summarize these three characteristics. He warns them. And he says, listen, guys, you got to beware. These guys are doing these things. They're forcing other people to become circumcised. And you know what? They're totally, totally missing it. When God initiated the covenant of circumcision, it was something physical, but it was a spiritual promise. They had taken this physical act and made it the center of attention. And their heart was very far from God. 
You know, you can take something good and completely remove the spiritual application. You can take something that God designed for good in your life and completely miss his intent behind what he's doing. When Christ came in, Christ was the end of the law. He was the fulfillment of the law. Now in Christ, we are free. You don't have to be a Jew and follow the traditions of the Jews to what? To know God. You can come to God by faith in his son, who was a Jew, who is the king of Jews, without ever doing any of those things. Write this down, please. It says, know your spiritual position in Christ Jesus. Know your spiritual position in Christ Jesus. Look here, please, at verse 3. Paul says, For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put how much confidence in the flesh? No confidence in the flesh. This is something that we have to remind ourselves of constantly. Paul was saying, listen, guys, I want you to know right now, you are God's child. Right now, you have been cut in the heart. Your heart has been transformed. You are now God's child. You don't have to do all of these things to become a child of God because the circumcision that God is after is the circumcision of the heart. So what they did many, many years ago where they would cut around a male child. Now what God is doing is cutting around our hearts. And he's cutting around in such a way where we are transformed. And the life that we are now living, it's to please God. It's not to lift ourselves up. Have you ever thought about the practices that you have done over this last year? And the practices that God has asked us to do and how they connect? In other words, why do you do some of the things that you do in the name of spirituality? Why do you do some of the things that you do in the name of knowing God? Is God after our performance? Or is God after our worship? You know one observation that I've made? The person who is worshiping God in spirit and in truth is always willing to serve God with their time. The person who is trying to collect all these things and, and get you know, things in order because they think God's going to be pleased by this, they're tired, they're usually complaining, and after a while they, they give up. But Paul is taking them back to the real idea behind what God had intended. And you don't have to look it up, but in Romans 8.28, or 2.28 rather, he says, no one is a Jew who merely is one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart. Now listen, by the Spirit, not by the letter. How is it that we are right with God when God changes our heart? How is it that we can have a real relationship with God, not something that's dead and filled with just, you know, orthodoxy and rules. It's by allowing God to change our heart and transform us into the image of his son. Look here at verse 3. He says, For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God. So the first thing he says is, the true believer is one who worships by the Spirit. I hope during the week you have time and you make time to worship God in spirit and in truth. I hope when you come Sunday morning, you don't come thinking, you know, what is the guy or gal next to me doing? You know, I hope you can kind of block them out in one sense as you're worshiping God in song and as you're praying to him collectively as a church, we're offering our corporate worship to God. What God wants from us is to be worshipers. Listen, I'm going to be out of a job in heaven. There are no preachers in heaven. We're going to be worshiping God 
in heaven. Why not practice now? So he says the first characteristic of someone who is a true believer, who's been changed in their heart, their heart has been cut away, is that they worship God in spirit and in truth. Look at the second one. It says they glory in Christ Jesus. They glory in Christ Jesus. And the idea here is very simple. They're not living to call attention to themselves. These guys on the basketball court, what they wanted more than anything was for people to see them as these great players. And some of them were very good. Very good. But the Christian life is about giving God the glory, pointing to him in the things that happen in our lives, not saying, this is for me. And the last part is, and put no confidence in the flesh. No confidence in the flesh. Now, write this down. It says, you have been spiritually transformed. You have been spiritually transformed. And of, and of course, this is talking about people who've confessed Christ as their Savior. And since you've been spiritually transformed, it says, worship God in spirit and in truth. Worship God in spirit and in truth. And the next one says, live to honor and magnify Jesus Christ. So you've been spiritually transformed. Worship God in spirit and in truth. And live to honor and magnify Jesus Christ. How many of you in these last two years have had to write from scratch or update your resume? Either because you're sending it to a college or you're applying for a job. Many of you? Isn't that a fun process? No, not really, I know. But you have to do it, right? It's just one of those requirements. Paul had an impressive resume. He was incredibly gifted, very smart, and his resume was just at the top of the food chain, so to speak. Look here for a minute at verse 4. He says this, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Now, Paul begins to list his resume. He begins to share with these believers, listen, I want you guys to know that I was pretty good. I mean, I had some real good things going for me according to to the flesh, according to the worldly standards. The first thing he says is that he was circumcised on the eighth day. So right from his early age, he was a, a Jew. He was circumcised as the law commanded. The second thing says he was of the people of Israel. So Paul was from the line of Jacob. He was from the tribe of Benjamin, which if you remember your history, that was a good tribe. That was a tribe that was faithful to the king of Israel. It was an excellent tribe. Then he also says, well, if that's not enough, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. So he spoke Hebrew. He was very comfortable with the tradition, the languages. And then he says, as to the law, I was a Pharisee. Now, some people think in this time there were about 6,000 Pharisees. And these were like the top of the top as far as religious and education and law. And Paul was one of them. But Paul was taught by Gamileo and he really had a rich heritage educationally, intellectually, you know, in his lineage and his family. And then he continues, look at verse 6, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. This was a big thing because anything that went contrary to Judaism, he was going to fight and did he fight Christianity? Yes or no? Yes. I mean, he persecuted people. He was there when Stephen was stoned to death. And he was zealous. I mean, he was so passionate about putting these people to rest. And then he says, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Not that he was perfect, but he wasn't. But he did everything he needed to do according to the law. Now, what does this mean to you and I? Write this down. Confidence in your personal resume has been replaced by confidence in 
your savior. Confidence in your personal resume has been replaced by confidence in your savior. Paul said, listen guys, I want you to know all of these things that I've had, I mean, I had the best of the best. But something happened in Paul's life. Something changed in his life that gave him a different perspective as he looked at these things. Write the second point down. It says, what you have done is no longer as important as whom you have now become in Christ Jesus. The what is not as important as the whom. Now, Paul would be characterized as a super achiever. Why do I say that? Well, because he wasn't born necessarily in the same place that most of the prominent Jews were born. So he worked extra hard to study, to obey the law, to do all these things. And what we see through his life was he was an incredibly driven man. He was driven to, you know, kill the Christians and put them away. He was driven to make sure that the Pharisees and their agenda advanced. But he was incredibly driven. He was incredibly passionate. But here's the warning for you and I. You can be very passionate and strongly driven in the wrong direction. You can be so passionate like Paul and so set on doing things a certain way and accomplishing certain goals and getting this done that you don't even realize you're in the wrong place. You've taken a wrong road. But there's good news. You don't have to keep everything that you collect along the way. You don't have to keep everything that you collect along the way. Now, some of you have been driving you nuts because I haven't said much about this. And you're looking and wondering, when is he going to say something about this? You know, your ADD is kicking in and I'm here to help you. This is what? It's a garbage bag. It's a garbage bag. What typically do we put in a garbage bag? Garbage, right? I remember the unpleasant experience of in elementary school after getting my braces, I had a retainer that my mom forced me to wear. And I went to school one day and I put it on the lunch tray and I threw it away in the garbage in the school cafeteria. And simply because I wanted to continue living to at least this age, I went back in the garbage can and dug it out. Not a pleasant experience, but I was more afraid than what my parents would do to me than if I didn't go back home with the retainer, than what the worms and the other stuff would do if I you know, handled them. But it's really interesting what Paul does because the Bible tells us that Paul, in his pursuit of destroying Christians, was met by Jesus Christ in person. He was blinded by a light and Jesus met Paul on the road to Damascus. And he said, Paul, you know, Paul, in this case, it was Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Modern day translation, what's up with you, man? What, what are you doing? Paul was blinded. He had to have somebody escort him. And he had a spiritual encounter with the living Christ. Not with the religion, not with a set of rules, not with a do this and don't do that and make sure you do this and cross this T and, and dot this I. He had an encounter with Jesus Christ. And from that day forward, everything changed. He looked at his accomplishments. He goes, you know, I've done everything that a man could want to do as a spiritual leader in Israel. I've got all of the accolades. I've got all of the awards. I have all the recognition. People want me to be their mentor. You know, I am the man. But all of this in comparison to Christ is, well, we'll take a look at it in a minute here. So you don't have to keep everything you collect, but look at this point. To win well, you first have to lose well. To win well, you first have to lose well. And what we're talking about here is your life as a believer. Your life as a believer 
in the end, whenever that end is, you want to win well. And in order to win well, there are certain things that you have to be willing to lose. Look here at verse 7. Paul said, but whatever gain I had, I counted as what? Loss. Would you circle that word loss? I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. This idea is much like an accountant where there's a profit category and there's a what? A loss category. I'm looking at my profits. I'm looking at my losses and I'm saying, you know what? I thought my life was filled with profit. But the reality is I was trusting in all of that stuff to make me right with God. And the reality was I was at a loss spiritually. Although really everyone else thought I was at a profit. Have you ever been there where you thought what you were doing was the best thing and somebody said there's a better way? There's a different way. There's something that you haven't considered. You haven't thought about this technology or you haven't done it this way. There's something different. And all this work you've put in all of a sudden is good for nothing. It's easier just to pack it up and throw away what you were doing and say, you know what? I'm going to start from this point forward. And Paul looked at his life and he says, you know, all of this stuff that I was accumulating, all of this stuff that I was just trying so hard to do, I was going in the wrong direction. And when I met Christ, everything became clear. It says here in your notes, in the spiritual world, the more you lose, the more you can gain. The more you lose, the more you can gain. And the idea behind loss here is something that I'm counting as damaged. It's damaged. It's not good for anything. And back in Philippians 1.21, you remember what Paul said? He said, for me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Well, wait a minute. Didn't Paul gain all of these things? by being one of the top intellectuals, the most respected teachers, one of the key influencers in driving out the Christians. Didn't he gain all of this? Well, he thought he did. But then he met Christ and he realized, I've lost. I've been thinking that all of this stuff is going to give me such an incredible stature with God when I see him one day and I'm doing all these things and I'm following every single letter of the law. And I realize that because of Christ, this means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. What do you have in your bag? We all have bags, right? We all have things in our life that we've accumulated. We all have hurts. We all have sins in our lives. How many of you are 30 or under? Let me see your hands. 30 or under. Okay. Maybe this is representate, you know, representative of your bag. If you're over 30, oh, oh, your bag is a little bigger. Your bag is a little bigger. We accumulate more. We have more. And if we're on the wrong road, we think, well, because I've done all this or because I haven't done this, I'm Okay. Me and God are like this. I worship God in my closet. I don't have to go to church. It's just he and me. We're, we're good. But what if all those things that you thought were good, God actually considered those things as garbage? What if all those things you thought were great, you, you get before God one day and say, God, here's my stuff. Your stuff's not going to let you into heaven. But when Paul had this amazing encounter with Jesus Christ, the light bulb went off and he said, now I get it. Now I understand. This is not about a collection of things that I can do so that people will say, great job. Man, you're so smart. Your mother must be so happy. No, when Christ comes into the picture, it's all about him and it's not about us. 
And the struggle that you and I have in this culture is that every day on the internet, on Google, on Facebook, they say what? It's all about you. And Paul came to the realization that none of this stuff that I've had means anything. Christ is all that I need. Could you say that this morning? Could you say that this morning and say, you know what? I know I've sinned. I know I have garbage in the bag. But Christ is my all in all. Look here in verse 8. He says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. In other words, listen, nothing can compare with this fact. Jesus Christ is my Lord. That's the most important thing. Jesus Christ is my Lord. I know him personally. I know him experientially. He is my Savior. He is my Lord. Write this down, please. In Christ, what you lose cannot be compared with whom you have gained. What you lose cannot be compared with whom you have gained. In verse 8, he continues, For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things. Now, I want you to circle this last word. And count them as rubbish. Would you circle that word? I just love that word. Rubbish. Rubbish. In other words, it's the shock factor again. Listen, guys. This that I have lost means absolutely nothing. I count this as garbage. It's even a stronger word than that in the original language. But nothing can compare. In order that I may gain Christ, look at verse 8, the, the latter part. In order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. Where are you found? You know what happened to Paul? Paul took all of his stuff, all of his recognition, all of his sins. And basically what he did, when he followed Christ, when he said yes to Christ, he allowed the blood of Christ to cover all of his stuff. Now his stuff didn't go away in the sense that he was still a smart guy, he was still an intellectual, he was still a Hebrew of the Hebrews, but now God was using his stuff for a greater good. Now he was placed on the right road and now he was helping others. No, this is the truth. Listen, guys, it doesn't matter how many degrees you have on the wall. It doesn't matter how many gains you have in your stock portfolio. What matters is if Jesus Christ and you are one. What matters is if his blood has covered your sins and he's using your life today to tell other people about him. It doesn't matter how many awards you've collected. It doesn't matter how much recognition you get. It doesn't matter how many degrees you have. Paul said, I count it all as loss. I count it all as garbage. I count it all as nothing to be found in Christ. Wow. That's a powerful statement. That's a powerful statement. He continues. Not having a righteousness, verse 9, of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. See, Paul, like many Jews 
in that time, they felt that if we would follow the laws, if we would do all these things the right way, the way that God wants us to do, then God will, we're his people physically, so obviously we have to be his people spiritually. Not so. Not so. When Christ came, he made it very, very clear. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So now they had to make a decision. Wait a minute. Am I going to stay in these traditions or am I going to move in the direction of faith? And Paul says, listen, it's very simple. I count it all loss because of Jesus Christ and knowing him and his righteousness, not my own. Look at verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Write a couple things down here. It says, talking about believers, I am made right with God through faith in Jesus Christ. I am made right with God through faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. God's not impressed with my resume. He really isn't. I'm not either, but he's not impressed with our resumes. When we stand before God, we're going to stand with our own garbage or we're going to stand with the blood of Christ. Which one do you think is going to get into heaven? The garbage is not. This represents when I surrender my life to God, when I stop being so prideful about how much money I make and how educated I am and what family I'm from and how many hits I have on Facebook and all this other stuff, and I say, I'm going to confess Jesus Christ as my Savior and my Lord, and I'm going to learn about him step by step. The side of the garbage says, no, I'm a pretty good person. I haven't killed as many people or I haven't done this and I'm okay. I don't need Jesus Christ. The Bible says you're condemned to hell right now. So when Paul says we are present tense right now, the children of God. The other side of that is those who are not the children of God right now are the children of the devil. But you and I have to choose. Number two, as a believer, I have eternal and eternal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not something that anyone can take away. This is forever. Number three, I can know the Father, Son, and Spirit personally. I can know the Father, Son, and Spirit personally. Did a marriage retreat a couple of weeks ago, and... It was a group of people from a, a church in Hialeah, and we were laughing. We had a good time. It was like a Que Pasa USA marriage retreat. We had a lot of fun. And in the marriage retreat, I said to them, I said, you know, one of the reasons I married my wife was because we were friends, and we wanted to become better friends. So she looked at me and smiled. I looked at her. I said, okay, a few dollars in the love bank there were deposited, and, and we were laughing. But if you think about what God wants from us, God doesn't want our stuff. God wants our heart. He wants us to come to him in a broken, contrite spirit, humbly recognizing him as God, speaking to him as our father. So we're not talking about a list of do's and don'ts. We're talking about knowing the creator. And number four says, I can experience the power of Jesus' resurrection. You don't have to be a rocket science scientist to walk around and see how many broken lives are around us. You don't even have to go to the bad neighborhoods to see how many broken lives are around us. God can change every life. God can change any life. And the same power that raised Jesus from the dead can change your heart can change your spirit from death to life. Look here at verse 11 as we close this up. And he says, he concludes, and I may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection 
from the dead. It says here, I am privileged to share in personal suffering to make Jesus known to others. To make Jesus known to others. Paul was willing to suffer. Whatever it takes, are we willing to suffer? Are we willing to endure when someone makes fun of us because of our faith? Paul certainly was. It says, I have the honor of living a crucified life. A life that says yes to God and no to self. And the last point here, it says, I can die to my temporary personal agendas so that others might live eternally. Paul was encouraging them. He wanted them to know that they are now free to live. Free to live. They are now free to be who God has made them to be. They don't have to have all of these rules and all of these things weighing them down. He wants them to be free to live for Christ. So as we close, we go to this idea. I have to lose more to gain more. I have to lose more to gain more. If I want to know Christ more, I have to be willing to lose more. If I want more rewards in heaven, I have to be willing to set aside rewards here. I have to be willing to take everything that God has allowed me to be to this point and use that to be everything that God wants me to be from here on out. It says, I have to lose more to gain more. And that's our prayer today. Would you pray with me this morning?